wife uh, runs Parek Family Foundation, who does uh, innumerable charitable and educational activity in third world countries, including India. And uh, Dr. Salim Parek is credited to perform first total ankle replacement in India way back in 2012. And almost every year he is doing ankle replacements in India in the uh, While screen sharing, you have to share computer sound only then the video will be able to be played properly. So you have to stop the screen share now and then restart the screen share. I think it is still not a sound is not there. Uh, who's sharing the screen? I can give him instruction. He's not doing it properly. Uh, Alpesh, who is sharing the screen? Well, I'm, I'm sharing it. So maybe yes. Um, and the smart watch. So we've come a long way uh, in the 21st century with technology really advancing. Sudeep, I uh, who is sharing? Yes. Please share the screen, please. So, yes. when you have to share the screen, usme niche ek option rata hai, share computer sound okay. and optimize for video clip. You have to tick both. Only then the sound will come. Fine, fine. Got it. Travel, but uh, hopefully in the next year, yes, okay, I'll we'll be back to India. So, uh, I've been asked to talk Make it full screen, please. Total. Make it full screen. Uh, replacement and yes, 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 yes. no, not like ah, yeah, not like this. Full screen on the right side top. Yes. On and, and please play now. Restrictions on travel, but uh, hopefully in the next year we will be back to India. So uh, I've been asked to talk about total ankle uh, replacement and an update on ankle replacements. Let me see. All right. Um, are you guys able to see my screen? 
Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yes, yes. So, you know, total acre replacements have come a long way and, and we, we are now in the 21st century where we have access to electric cars that uh, look like Falcons and can go hundreds of miles between charges. Uh, you're able to wear smart glasses that allow you to do things on voice command. Uh, we have smart contact lenses that can man uh, to monitor your glucose levels. We have smart spoons that for the Parkinson's patient can help stabilize their tremors and you have smart t-shirts that can monitor your vital signs um, and then the smart watch. So we've come a long way uh, into the 21st century with technology really advancing the things we can do. So why not have total ankle replacements that can allow athletes and individuals be more uh, mobile, to be more active into their, into their later ages, even after they've had ankle arthritis due to traumas or due to rheumatoid arthritis. Let's give these individuals an opportunity to have motion. So why total ankle? Well, severe painful post-traumatic ankle arthritis is extremely painful. And in fact, there's data to suggest that end-stage ankle arthritis is as severe, if not more severe than end-stage hip disease. Um, we need solutions for these patients because these patients suffer from debilitating pain. They can have large bone loss. They can have other joint uh, adjacent joint disease. They can have bilateral involvement. And we're looking for solutions that provide them with pain relief and preserve motion and stability. And so you have patients that look like this who have end-stage ankle arthritis or like this who have post-traumatic ankle arthritis or even like this who have uh, varus ankle deformities or valgus ankle deformities. And they are looking for opportunities to maintain uh, their quality of life through preserving joint motion. So the indications for ankle replacement are really uh, in, the, in the optimal patient when you first start out doing ankle replacements, that optimal patient has less excessive demands and they tend to be the rheumatoid patients, the older patients, the post-traumatic patients, who again, tend to be over the 60 year old mark, or those patients who have multiple joint disease. However, as you get more comfortable with ankle arthritis and total ankle replacement, you will expand those indications. And now at our institution, and including in my practice, I've done teenagers who have ankle arthritis because we are comfortable with the revisions that may need to happen in their life. So the relative indication are the youthful active individuals and the contraindications traditionally are Taylor avascular necrosis, Charcot joint disease, neurologically compromised foot, or patients who have chronic infections. Now, end-stage ankle arthritis can be very complex, right? You have patients who can have the straight ankle that are properly aligned, and those patients who have malalignment. And in fact, uh, about 37% of patients only have normal alignment with ankle arthritis. The rest will have some type of deformity that you need to be able to correct. So you have to be able to and be comfortable to do adjacent joint or adjacent or, or, or concomitant uh, ankle, foot and ankle procedures to help balance that ankle when you do the uh, total ankle replacement. You've got to appreciate the deformities both on the AP view with varus and valgus, but also on that sagittal view where you can see sagittal malalignment where the tails can be sublux anterior or posteriorly. So how do we do these ankle replacements? Well, here's a 360-degree camera of the setup in my operating room, and it's it's got a lot of individuals in there. Not only the surgical team, but we also have the rep, the the team from the companies or the reps, as we call them, to help support the case. And then uh, you, you've got the sterile uh, back table, with, which has all of the sets open for whatever we're thinking about doing. And when we look at ankle replacements, we have come a long way, uh, and it's evolved. When we first started doing these, you had these these uh, uh, half ankle replacements that had a poly on the other side, which had tibial component loosening over time. And as it loosened, the, the tails could rattle and end up with a, um, a malleolar fracture. And in the latest, uh, in the last generation, so before the latest generation, you have, and you, you still have globally, but you had these implant companies who had these total ankle replacements that respected the anatomy more but still took a quite, a, quite a lot of bone away from the, from the joint. And when that happened, it would, you, you would struggle with revision type surgeries. So the common issues we saw in the previous generation, right before this latest generation, were tibial trays causing fibular impingement because these were not anatomic implants. 
you have the, a limited ability to restore sagittal alignment, that Taylor talus that's anterior posteriorly subluxed, you really couldn't do much with it except for releases. It took too much bone away. So these were not bone sparing devices. And so you worried about injury to the Taylor blood supply. We had difficulty with Taylor loosening on the Taylor side. And you had this cumbersome instrumentation that, uh, that made it difficult to put the ankle for placement exactly where you wanted it, which is important for uh, ankle placements to get the alignment that you need. So impingement, why is this important? Well, because you have a right ankle and you have a left ankle that have incisoras that house the fibula. And so you need to have an implant right and left that allows you to recreate the anatomy to house the fibula. Because if you put a rectangular device into the tibial uh, the tray, you will impinge that fibula. And so the latest models are more anatomic, they're fixed bearing, minimal bone resection, they keep the instrumentation simple, but allow the surgeon to be able to place the implant exactly where they want them. And we believe that these are reproducible outcomes for, uh, in the long term for patients. This is the cadence ankle replacement uh, and allows you to have 670 different combinations of Taylor component, poly component, and um, and a tibial component to allow you to give the patient a custom implant without really having a custom implant. And it allows you to also have biased polys, which this was the first implant on the market to allow you to do that. It also had a tibial tray base plate that it had that incisura, so it was more anatomic and, and respected the fibular anatomy. Um, it also had some other features uh, which allowed you to upsize or downsize the implant without having to worry about new peg holes that you're making or, or new um, um, uh, holes in the, in the tibia or in the talus that made you fixed to one size. And that's important because if you're in the operating room and you think it, this patient needs a size two and you start putting the trials in and you realize, wait a minute, it's a size one or it's size three, you should have that flexibility to be able to upsize or downsize the total angle as needed. And so again, the tibial base plate has this incisura and so this is what this implant looks like on x-ray. Again, like I was saying, the poly, this is the first system that had a poly that was biased, either anteriorly or posteriorly, to help fix that sagittal alignment, which some papers suggest can be up, upwards of 30 to 60% of total ankle replacements can have this sagittal malalignment. And so to have a poly to be able to push the tails back or pull it forward, whatever the case may be, is important. So you wanna get that alignment, the center of the talus, you wanna get it back underneath the tibia where it belongs. And so here's a case where we are able to use the poly to pull that uh, talus back into the center of the tibia. And then you have to do some, uh, some concomitant uh, procedures to help get the alignment that you want. Here's another implant. This is the Vantage Exact Tech implant. Again, it's anatomic, fixed bearing, minimal bone resection. It has axial pegs that go into the tibia with the presumption being that this also will allow for better fixation into the, into the, uh, in, into the tibia. Uh, it allows also for acceptance of the, of the incisura by, by just having a mild uh, curvature to the tibial, plate, uh, tibial tray. So again, uh, it allows for a more anatomic fixation. Um, again, it has these vertical cages that are fixed into the tibia. Um, so those are the two newest implants that are on the market uh, starting to percolate globally. But when you look at the, in the U.S., the total ankle market, it is full of total ankle replacements that are currently on the market with new ones that are coming out later this year and even next year. So it is a very crowded space for a small volume of cases. The outcomes for total ankle replacements we know is very good. Patients have, uh, ha are better with an ankle replacement than ankle fusion patients when walking up the stairs, walking downstairs, walking uphill. And that makes sense because you have ankle motion. Total ankle patients have higher rates of satisfaction and better biomechanics of gait than ankle arthritis patients uh, that, are, that are fixed with fusions. The bilateral gait mechanics are much better with, uh, with ankle replacement patients. It's closer to normal with ankle replacement patients than with ankle fusion patients. Uh, the, the, uh, the pain relief is the same, equal, ankle fusion versus ankle replacement. But again, total ankle replacement patients at two years have better gait, better mechanics, better pain relief. So for me, ankle arthroplasty in the young is no longer a relative indication. 
I think the benefits of range of motion, pain relief, activity level when younger is much more critical than waiting, than fusing them when they're younger. And then when they're older, trying to take that, take down that fusion and give them an ankle replacement. To me, that doesn't make sense. And that used to be the prevalent school of thought that you fuse them when they're early, you take it down when they're older. And, and when you fuse them, you no longer move the muscles that are in and around the, the ankle. And so as they get atrophied to 10 or 15 years later, then try to take down the ankle replacement and try to give patients motion again, really never made sense to me. So here's one of my patients who in her early 20s uh, got an ankle replacement. She is now in her mid 30s and the left ankle is where she had the ankle replacement. And you can see it still allows her to be fashionable where the shoes she, she likes. And she also is able to run, although against my medical advice. So, I, you know, I told you avascular necrosis is a relative contraindication. And only recently has it become a relative contraindication. You know, you have a patient who has uh, ankle AVM like this. And in the past, they were either uh, told that they can only get non-surgical treatment with some type of ankle brace or that they can get a TTC fusion which was fraught with non-unions, anywhere from 30 to 60% non-union rate of one of these joints, uh, either the ankle or subtalar joint for, for uh, um, TTC fusion in the setting of ABN. So the challenge of ABN is, is that it's, it's hard to treat. 75% of the time, ABN is due to trauma. 90% of Taylor neck fractures go on to develop uh, ABN. And this has actually become, at least in the US, a little bit more of interest in the last few days because of Tiger Woods um, unfortunately had a serious injury to his lower extremity. One of those injuries was a Taylor, uh, Taylor fracture. We don't know if it was Taylor neck or body, but the point is it has elevated this discussion in the U.S. temporarily uh, in uh, ABN. 25% of atraumatic patients, 25% uh, of ABN patients are atraumatic, and that can be due to sickle cell disease, exposure to corticosteroids at some point in their life. Uh, patients who've had a failed ankle replacement who developed ABN of the talus, and, and then led to uh, an ankle replacement uh, uh, failure. And then you have your idiopathic cases where we don't really know why they're developing ABN. So the indication for a total talus is patients who have Taylor ABN, talus non-unions, Taylor collapse after ankle replacement, patients who've had subchondroplasties done. This is a product that is in the market um, where uh, we used to believe that if you had Taylor edema, you could actually stabilize that Taylor edema um, with calcium phosphate. What our group has noticed and has now published is that oftentimes these patients end up with Taylor AVN because that calcium phosphate has choked off the blood vessels in the talus and now led to Taylor AVN. The relative indication for total talus is that youthful active individual, but I'll share with you some cases that we've done in up to 14 year olds. And then the contraindications are the same as total ankle replacement, the Charcot patients, the neurologically compromised foot, or patients who have chronic infections. And so here's a 19-year-old girl who had a CML as a young teenager. She was exposed to prednisone as a young te teenager. Five years later, she has AVN and continued pain bilaterally. And you can see on this uh, MRI, both uh, up on the upper left as well as the lower right, that she has significant AVN, not only her tails, but distal tibia, and even someone in her calcaneus. And so uh, the father lives in another state, finds us on social media and, and realizes what we're doing, reaches out to me and says, hey, you know, is there any motion sparing option you can provide my daughter? So here's a total tail list that we are planning um, on CAD drawings. And how we do this is same thing as an ankle replacement. We go in through the standard anterior approach. We take a wedge out of the tailored neck. And so that separates the body from the head. It also disrupts the interosseous ligament. So now that the body and, and, and allows the body and the tailor head to be loose and mobile. We then go ahead and take out the tailor head and then the body to the left. And when the first time you do this, it is amazing look at the anatomy of the posterior facet on the calcaneus, uh, which is a, a view that most of us have never seen before. And then we have these trials. So using the CT scan, the company uh, can, can out the exact replica of this patient's anatomy, either using their affected limb if the anatomy is intact or using the contralateral side if the anatomy is not intact and then obviously doing a mirror image to, uh, to, to provide the, the talus. 
And so you have these trials of the, of the normal size talus, and then uh, we also have 10% decrease and 10% increase in size. And so we get a tray with these trials and then the, and the total talus, which used to be silver, which was cobalt chromium. And now we have an option of these gold ones that are titanium nitride, which we believe uh, uh, wears better against the cartilage. And when you put these taluses in and you have the right size, it's almost like a bipolar hip where you hear, hear the thud, you'll hear thud into the joint. And that's when you know you have the right size. And if you look at this motion, I mean, this is an unparalleled motion, whether it's for, for ankle, uh, total ankle, you just don't see this type of motion. Um, and, and it's pretty remarkable what these patients can get back. And so, you know, we, we initially started doing this on patients who had restricted ADN in, uh, in the talus without associated adjacent joint arthritis. But then we started getting more sophisticated and I started getting a little more bold, taking on those patients at ADN who also had ankle arthritis. And so here's a patient who came in to see me from uh, uh, Hawaii and he has bad ankle arthritis, a sublux to, uh, talus, and also a vascular necrosis. But we can now take a total talus, take care of their ADN, put in an ankle replacement. So this talus is, is, is matched to the total ankle and allow us to replace his ankle, give him a new talus, he maintains motion, gets pain relief, and, and actually has an active life. This is a patient who is now three months out from her total talus and against my advice, started doing box jumps. So this is jumps where you, you're on the floor, you jump up on a box, you jump down on the, on the floor, you jump back up even higher, you jump back down. So she's doing impact activities, which we don't want these total ankle or total tailor patients to do three months out from surgery because she's feeling so great. It's pretty amazing to see these patients function. Um, here's a patient who has AVN with ankle arthritis and subtalar arthritis. And we can now do total taluses with an ankle replacement with subtalar fusions. And so we're getting more and more sophisticated as to what we can address. Here's a patient with AVN, subtalar uh, arthritis, ankle arthritis, but also a varus deformity and a fixed varus deformity. And she came in to see me and said, Dr. Parekh, either you amputate me or you do something to salvage my motion. And so we did a stage procedure where we put on an external fixator. I cleaned out the talus, actually put uh, a spacer in. Her talus looked a little questionable. It turned out she had a subclinical infection. So we cleared that. And then we did this total talus ankle fusion, uh, sorry, ankle replacement with a subtalar fusion. Now her alignment's much better on the sagittal view, but you can see that her talus is a little bit plantar flexed into the calcaneus, but she has a limb, she's walking, she's able to be active something that she could not do with her varus, AVN, and go arthritis. Here's a patient who had a triple arthrodesis done by me. Uh, he then developed ankle arthritis, so we ended up doing a total ankle replacement. And then I usually like to see my ankle arthroplasty patients every year. Well, this patient got lost to follow-up, which usually means they're doing so well and it's inconvenient for them to come see you. He lives uh, uh, about three hours away from me by flight. And then he, he shows up seven years after his surgery. And you know that when you haven't seen a patient for a while and then they show back up, it's usually a bad thing. So he comes in to see me and if you can look at that talus, you can see the talus has collapsed. He has developed Taylor avascular necrosis under this ankle replacement. And so we can use 3D printing to create a brand new total uh, talus, which has an undersurface that allows for a fusion to still occur so we can maintain the correction we got on the triple arthrodesis. And he has now salvaged his, uh, his motion. He's back to playing 18 holes of golf three to four times a week, and he's happy. And uh, I haven't seen him again. So it's usually a good sign, like I said. This is a patient, uh, a sad story. This is a girl, um, and this is not Tiger Woods' uh, car. This is a girl who um, lost control of her car, hit a, uh, a wall, and get, uh, ended up getting extricated from the car. Uh, they lived about six hours away from Durham where I'm located. And uh, the girl is 19 years old, was taken to the emergency room, had bilateral injuries on the left side. She has an open talus that is uh, extruded. The talus was extruded. On the right side, she has a pilon fracture. So the trauma team in this hospital puts her in the X-fix on the right side, talks to the mom about primary uh, amputation 
The mom begs them not to do it. The next day returns to the scene of the accident, finds the talus bone and brings it back to the surgeon who now says, listen, there's nothing I can do with this talus because it's been extruded for too long. So she comes in to see me, has a cement spacer in, and uh, mom, so mom was told it's an amputation that this girl needs. The mom gets on the line, finds us on social media, what we're doing at our institution, brings the daughter to us. And, uh, and, and not only, if you look carefully, not only is she missing some of her talus, she's also missing the medial malleolus. So, um, and, and she's got an open injury. So uh, we end up clearing the infection first. And while we're cleaning the infection, we maintain the external fixator, but we also start designing a new medial malleolus for her, as well as a total talus. And so um, this is the medial malleolus that we are creating, and it has a stem, and as well as a plate. The plate will allow us to put in uh, screws that go from the plate into the stem. This is her total talus. And so she now has a 3D printed medial malleolus, as well as a total talus. She's now 21 years old, has a limb. She's able to date, she to get dressed up things that are important for a 21 year old uh, to live life in a meaningful way. She's now able to do rather than having an amputation or prosthesis. Here's a patient who came in to see me from about eight hours away from, from our institution, has this bad uh, um, injury um, <clears throat> that's treated locally by her surgeons. So it gets this plate, gets the pitting of the, of the talus, ends up with this modeling of the talus a few months after his injury comes in to see me, he's got an elevated ESR CRP, his white count uh, is, is not elevated at all. This is a uh, three-phase bone skin showing uh, a hot area in his, in his ankle, so he's infected. So we have to go in and clean out this infection with a cement spacer. He grows out propionic bacterium. We clear the infection, but if you look here, he now has some subtalar disease, ankle disease, as well as talonavicular disease. And so we can with 3D printing, I think I've showed you that we can do some really amazing things. And so he's, he was my first uh, total talus with a subtalar fusion and a tailored navicular fusion with our ankle replacement. So we do a lot of biologics around the ingrowth surface of the talus. We've got this uh, fixation. This is what it looks like in the operating room. This is what it looks like under fluoros. And uh, we have been able to get him back to work. He's about a year and a half out from the surgery has one to two out of, uh, uh, out of 10 pain and they've done well. So we always hear, uh, you know, we're an academic institution, we're interested in looking at the data and we always hear, you know, how do these patients really do? So our first paper, we wanted to look at patients who've been about 12 months uh, with their total talus, but we wanted to look at if we really restore their anatomy. So this is our first 14 patients um, and a lot of these tailor, uh, tailored again patients collapse, so they lose their height. And so um, we know that now through this paper, we know that we can restore their height. This is statistically significant. And we can also restore their tailor tilt. So as they get collapsed, you can imagine the bond, the tails can start uh, getting malaligned. <clears throat> and we can restore that uh, uh, through, the, uh, through the total tail system. And that makes sense. And this is statistically significant restoration of their anatomy. So from this data, we know that total taluses can restore anatomy. Um, and they can allow us to have viable options uh, for patients who have to uh, tailored AVN. But what about their function? So this is the first 15 patients of ours that passed the 12 month mark, uh, patients who have tailored AVN. Um, and, and we look at their preoperative uh, foot and ankle orthopedic scores versus their postoperative. And you can see here in the green bars, every single green bar is further beyond the blue bar, which means they're clean, they're simple, the sports and recreation activities, the activities of daily living, and the quality of life metrics have all improved uh, that are statistically significant. And now we've, we've started looking at our two-year data. All right, so these are patients who are now past the two-year mark. Uh, the average is 22.2 months. And uh, the mean age of these patients is 43 year old, 43 years old with AVN. Their ankle range of motion is uh, uh, post-op is, is similar to their pre-op, but I'll tell you that I, I think that this is probably not accurate because when I see them, they have better motion. We've done it uh, in controlling uh, procedures to help get them some of that motion. More importantly, their visual analog pain scores has been, have improved, and this is statistically significant. So if they're living on average at a seven beforehand after surgery, 
they're at a three. Most are, I'll tell you, at about a one or two, but the average is about a three. Their FAOS, FAOS scores continue to be improved from pain, symptoms, quality of life, their activity of daily living. So we know now, and we will continue to track this, that total uh, TALS patients who are using the total TALS to treat ADN and adjacent joint disease have significant improvement in all metrics that we've looked at, have better anatomy. We are going to continue to follow this, this uh, patient population. Um, we are now over about 100 of these patients in our database, more than any other place in the world for 3D printed total TALS. Is. But again, this is the tip of the iceberg. We're offering options where patients didn't have options before, and we're giving them hope. With marrying this type of technology of 3D printing with total ankles, we have something that's reliable. Total ankles alone have excellent survivorship. They have pain relief. This is a versatile solution for this patient population. But again, the future here is going to be 3D printing, really giving these patients uh, um, very anatomic solutions for their disease states. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Salin. Uh, now we have our next speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Dujela. He is a board certified foot and ankle surgeon. He is a national chairman of the Education and Scientific Affairs uh, Committee for the American College of uh, Foot and Ankle Surgeons. He is executive board of the Global Foot and Ankle Community, and he is a surgical faculty Providence St. Peter Family Medicine Residency Program. And uh, he'll be talking on newer dimensions of management for chronic foot and ankle disorders. Thank you. How do I share my screen here with you all? Welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank it's you. Thank you very much. How do I share my screen so with you? There's a small green button there down. Share screen. The green button? Okay. Let's take a look here. Pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I'm on a few minutes late here. I had a little bit of confusion with the time and just came back from the hospital. So we're, we're glad to be here and share this with you. I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, can you see the slides now? No, sir. No. You want to alter plus as would also share your screen, Michael. I'm sorry? Alter, alter S. plus S. Alt S. Alter plus S. If you play, press this key, then also your share would be, screen would be shared. Can you see that? Yes. 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 Okay. How about yes, that? Perfect. Yes, no yes perfect. Yes, sure. Okay, Perfect. very good. Thank you. Thanks for being patient with me. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Shah has uh, asked me to talk. I'm, I'm pleased to be with you in the Baroda Orthopedic Association in your city and uh, some very fine faculty from the Indian Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society. I'm very uh, pleased about that affiliation that we've uh, garnered over the last few years. I have a huge amount of respect for the work that you're doing in India uh, and made many friends with you all and I hope to see you again in person soon. I'd like to talk a little bit about some changing techniques in foot and ankle surgery. And here in the US, one of the things that uh, I've been asked to talk about that I think can be of interest eventually in India even is uh, amniotic membrane use. Um, this is a technique that we've had around for a few years now, uh, is becoming a little bit more available in hospitals, but can be a bit costly in the United States. So uh, there are still some areas that we can't get equal access to this. So what's the role of the amniotic membrane? Uh, in surgery and, and what does it really mean? What is it, how do we integrate this into orthopedics and what other areas of medicine has it been used in? So amniotic membrane essentially is fetal tissue that's been electively donated. And this is not, it's important to know this is not coming from the fetus itself. It's from the maternal placenta. And what's unique about this is the biology of this is of course, fetal tissues are not equal to adult tissues. And so as we look at the wind healing cascade, we know of this concept of fetal scarless healing. Um, the problem is, is when we see this uh, change from fetus to uh, getting into more of the young uh, child or adult, we go from this phenotype where we have a 
scarless healing into more of a scarring and a scarring and adhesion phenotype. And that of course correlates directly with an inflammatory reaction. So as we see decreased inflammation, we know that we have decreased scar formation. And so that's one of the areas that becomes very influential when it comes to our decisions in foot and ankle surgery, because of course, some of what we're doing involves revisions and complex tendon work. So as we disrupt this inflammation by using this fetal scarless healing technology, using these amniotic membranes, we see decreased cytokine signaling and we decrease the lifespan of these pro-inflammatory cells which is very important, which of course also decreases the proliferation and infiltrations of our inflammatory cells. So what are the specific advantages of fetal scarless healing and amniotic membrane? While we certainly are anti-inflammatory properties, they are certainly anti-adhesive and that transfers to quite a bit less scarring. So as we have increased collagen types one, three, four, five, and six, we see fibronectin, laminins, growth factors, hyaluronin. So in the United States, uh, ophthalmolic surgery, general surgery, gynecologic surgery, neurosurgery, and foot and ankle are commonly used uh, places. We have over 300,000 cases done so far in the United States. So there's different varieties of this amniotic membrane, and it really comes down to the preservation techniques. So there's a company uh, in the U.S. that does a cryotech freezing process that allows this to maintain the uh, integrity of this extracellular matrix uh, with minimal tissue damage. So it seems to have the consistency of like a jellyfish. Uh, it's a moist tissue and it, it maintains a very nice handling characteristics. There are other types uh, out there that are uh, stored in a hypertonic salt solution. And then there is some loss of function in those and they're quite a bit more dry. They're almost like a seaweed type texture as you would see in sushi. So amniotic membrane, again, cryopreserved techniques, about 130,000 of these uh, at the time that I wrote this talk, now over 300,000, there's 300 publications out there. And what's nice is it prevents rejection. Uh, we see regenerative growth and there's actually a physical barrier and we'll take a look at some of these. So where do I use this in foot and ankle surgery and where is this potential? So oftentimes between the tendon sheath and or sheath in the skin, anywhere where there's raw bone, if we've resected bone or hardware, under scar prone incisions, revisional surgeries, particularly things like revisional perineal tendons or posterior tibial tendon surgeries. And it has a nice role also uh, when we're dealing with any nerve type surgery such as tarsal tunnel syndrome. So how do we utilize this? Well, we can do a wrap type technique around a structure such as a tendon. We call that a burrito technique uh, where we're wrapping it around the structure. We can interpose it in between layers where we would put it, for example, between tendon and sheath or even sheath in the skin if we need a barrier. And in some cases we do an on lane between the bone and the soft tissue. So there's different sizes and you can see the uh, sheath here, the sheath in this uh, ankle case. It's got kind of this gelatinous type appearance, but you can see you can, you can suture it intact. It's got some uh, integrity to it. It's not very flimsy. And so here, let's take a look at some different foot and ankle applications and some specifics. So primary and revision surgery. So not just revisional procedures, but even in some of our primary cases that we have where we consider a high risk for scarring, posterior tibial tendon, again, perineals are fraught with complications and uh, surgery such as tarsal tunnel, as I mentioned. Tarsal coalitions is another nice place to interpose uh, to create a barrier. Hallux rigidus, where we're concerned about rubbing and grinding of the bone, Freiburg's infraction, the second metatarsal, in some cases in total ankle replacement. So let's take a look at some specific uh, areas here. We'll talk about hallux limitus, hallux rigidus. So arthritis of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. So we know there's a role. This is an example here of an advanced arthritic joint. Many people would use this. You can see that cleric's amniotic graph there. And we know that scarring is a predictor of limited range of motion. And these types of surgeries, limited range of motion equi is equivalent to poor outcomes. So where motion is important, this is something that we would consider. If we're looking just at our decision-making with chylectomy, we know that we have predictable success with the earlier grades of hallux rigidus, stage one and two under Coughlin insurance classification. And as the joint becomes more arthritic and more sclerotic with marginal osteophytes, we become more difficult to see good results. So very rarely in grade four would we do this. 
but in grade three, if we have greater than 50% of the cartilage, it is something worth considering. So let's take a look at the results with chylectomy. Coughlin and Shurness published several years back a 9.6 year follow-up retrospective analysis showing 96% of the patients had good to excellent results. And this certainly correlated to the stage. The higher the stage, the poorer the outcome. So if we're beyond the stage two, we tend to see the outcomes decreasing quite dramatically. Mark Easley had 52 patients. Uh, AOFAS scores improved from 45 preoperatively to 85 postoperatively with the majority of these patients being satisfied. Similarly with Mann and Coughlin, 90% good to excellent results. This patient by, paper by Mullier, 20 high level athletes and 22 patient or 22 feet in a five-year retrospective look with 95% good to excellent results. One of the types of osteotomies we can use to help improve our range of motion and cheat a little bit is the Moberg osteotomy. And when we take the proximal phalanx, we can take a small wedge to increase the relative dorsiflexion, as well as combining this with a chylectomy to reduce the dorsal impingement. This is supposed to help the arc of motion. This is a nice option in uh, some of the younger patients. Um, you can, again, combine this with a chylectomy if you have less than 60 to 70 degrees of dorsiflexion intraoperatively. So in other words, if you have excellent dorsiflexion intraoperatively with your chylectomy alone, that may be sufficient. The other thing you could consider is taking a look at whether you've got tight distal plantar fascia or tight flexor uh, hallucis longus before instituting this Moberg osteotomy. One downfall to this Moberg osteotomy is that it does increase the dorsiflexion of the toe in kind of a cheating fashion. So if you do eventually progress to a fusion, you'll have to type, take that into consideration when you position your joint in the future. So looking at the results of the Moberg osteotomy, 57 patients with a three-year follow-up of Mark Easley had 90% satisfaction, noting reasonable increase in dorsiflexion. So decision-making, grade one, chylectomy. Grade two, as we get into fairly significant arthritic changes, chylectomy. And if we don't have 60 to 70 degrees of dorsiflexion on the table, we'll consider a Moberg osteotomy. And then grade three, if it's fairly advanced bone on bone arthritis, and particularly in my hands, if I see the arthritic changes at the central portion of the metatarsal head, the first metatarsal head, or extending into the inferior aspect, or if we see significant sesamoid involvement, these tend to have a poor prognosis and I'm more likely to do an arthrodesis procedure. So looking at the results with fusion, uh, Coughlin and Shurness again, 6.7 year follow-up, and 94% union rate with 100% report of good to excellent results. Not only increased propulsion, enhanced stability, and instability occurs all the way through the medial column of the foot, not just to the great toe joint. Let's take a look at some specific case using the amniotic membrane. So this is a case of pallectomy. You can see fairly advanced stage two, almost a stage three, first metatarsal phalangeal joint arthrodesis with a large dorsal osteophyte or dorsal flag sign. Intraoperatively, we would call this a parachute technique. You can see where we've removed the dorsal, probably 20 to 30 percent of the articular sur uh, surface that's been hibernated or the cartilage has been eaten away by arthritic change, and we've interposed the uh, amniotic membrane in between the joint, and, and we'll suture that in place, but also we've laid that in between the metatarsal head and the sesamoid apparatus where there's some arthritic change to try and create a little bit of a, a physical buffer or barrier. And you can see what that looks like in an onlay type of uh, application. So rather than an implant within the joint, but just an onlay to help improve range of motion to minimize the scarring over the joint where we wanna to try to improve our range of motion postoperatively. Um, this is an example here of the uh, parachute type technique as an interpersonal arthroplasty or anchovy type technique. Here's using a uh, Moberg type osteotomy, and you can see how that's created uh, with a uh, plantarly based or plantarly apexed wedge, uh, where you type to gradually feather that so you can dorsiflex it and you can fix it either with screws, small or small staple or a tiny plate. Here's an example <clears throat> where you could use this in a revision of a failed implant that was converted to a fusion. This is aseptic loosening and subsidence of a large total toe. <clears throat> and you can see the large bone that's uh, void that's created. So creation there of a dowel type uh, autograft to fill in that, and then using large dorsal locking plate to stabilize the site. 
and this would be a very nice uh, place to apply uh, amniotic membrane. Here's an osteochondral defect of the first metatarsophalangeal joint. You can see centrally here, we have a full thickness osteochondral defect, which you can see intraoperatively here. And we've treated this similarly to what we would do in a talus, where we remove the unstable fragment and the under, unstable underlying bone down to healthy bleeding bone. In this particular case, uh, we're using a technology, I'm not certain if this is available in India, but it's the juvenile particulated cartilage cells. And so this is taken from juvenile donor cartilage, uh, which is chipped up into very small uh, fragments of cartilage. It's it essentially put bone graft down, uh, then fiber and glue, and then we lay these juvenile particulated cartilage cells over top of that graft, and then another layer of fiber and glue. And then finally we interpose or do a parachute type technique or even an inlay or onlay type technique with this amniotic membrane, which you can see here on the far right. Again, tarsal tunnel syndrome is another place where we're seeing difficulties with post-operative scar trouble. Here in the US, very few people are doing tarsal tunnel surgical releases anymore because it's fraught with complications and very significant rate of medical legal complications here where a lot of people are being sued over poor outcomes associated with these surgeries. Um, so in these cases, uh, we're looking to have a very distinct uh, positive Tunnel sign. We love to see uh, a true positive nerve conduction study preoperatively rather than uh, you know, just vague neurogenic symptoms. We need something uh, to hang our hat on to be safe from a medical legal standpoint to operate on these people. In patients who have discrete space occupying lesions, if they have, for example, varicosities or you know, a enlarged distally based um, extra muscle belly in this case, uh, or um, for example, some type of space occupying mash, some type of tumor, these do quite well with tarsal tunnel and most of these seem to have a very nice full recovery. If there's any obvious damage to the nerve it itself, obviously we have variable recovery. And we like to know that we have objective data. Uh, the problem is a lot of the neurologists and here in the US phys physiatrists, which would be like a combination of a orthopedic medicine doctor and a neurologist, they're quite good with axial skeletal things, but when it comes to uh, getting adequate nerve conduction velocity testing of the distal extremities, and particularly when you start trying to differentiate the distal tarsal tunnel, from first branch of the lateral plantar nerve and differentiating Baxter's neuritis from the distal tarsal tunnel, they have very poor uh, ability to kind of differentiate that. So we have to be a bit cautious. So how do we improve our outcomes? We need to have our uh, targeted home runs here. Uh, people who have a positive uh, Tunnel sign, uh, people who have a positive nerve conduction velocity testing, people who have a definite point of entrapment, for example, with a space occupying lesion, and then, of course, an early decompression seems to do better than waiting a long time with these folks. And then a complete release, uh, rather than just simply releasing the laciniate ligament uh, over the tarsal tunnel, seems to do much better, particularly as we can get distal and release the abductor hallucis uh, muscle fascia, the deep fascia where it compresses the nerve. So let's take a look here. Uh, if we're looking at the surgical outcomes, Literature varies between about 42 to 85% success rate. Again, often better objective improvements than subjective. A lot of these patients still have difficulties. And again, releasing that abductor fascia is very important. So you can see here the delineation of the different branches in the vascularity. But of course, that's something that's potentially fraught with issues associated with scarring. Also in diabetic neuropathy here in the US, <clears throat> there are some tarsal tunnel surgical releases being done. There's, this is not a new concept, 20 years of literature. In these patients, a Tunnel sign is imperative, so it doesn't seem to do very well in patients who just have vague diabetic neuropathy or sensory neuropathy alone without actual tarsal tunnel type symptoms. So people like Lee Dellen have written extensively on this topic, <coughs> excuse me, and the success rate varies from 50 to 92%, although there is a higher percentage of these patients who seem to get pain relief. So early pre clinically Preclinical evidence suggests that uh, regenerative properties are quite good, in fact, comparable to autografts in, in a rat model. And we know that the amniotic membrane has anti adhesive properties and it shows decreased adhesion and scarring in the rat sciatic and rabbit ulnar nerve models. So there is some definite uh, data in the animal world. So anterior tarsal tunnel syndrome, uh, this is another instance. 
uh, deep perineal nerve decompression and, and uh, inlay in the dorsal aspect of the foot. Here's an example of uh, tarsal tunnel release here. The incisions carried out, carried down distally. And you identify that superficial fashion. You go through there and you reflect down the abductor hallucis muscle. We develop those borders and we release that deep fascia. We recognize our neurovascular bundle looking for any varicosities and looking at the nerve itself for any change. So you notice a little bit careful about how much release we do here, not so much digging around, but you can see here that deep fascia as we're uh, reflecting the abductor hallucis muscle down. You'll see if I, if I can point to that right here, this deep fascia right in that area, and that muscles kind of pull down. This really compresses down against that nerve here as it kind of traverses into the plantar aspect of the foot. So that's one of the key points. And then pulling the muscle in a proximal direction uh, allows that neurovascular bundle to move freely into the bottom of the foot once you've released both on the outer. So we'll release it on this side and then come around the back side and release it deep under there. So ideally, you'd like to be able to pass your fifth finger slightly underneath that muscle. So we're looking proximal for any other fibrous septae as well. So once that's all decompressed and we've branched that all out, we want to make sure there's nothing involving the medial calcaneal nerve. And then we'll drop our tourniquet and make sure that there's no excessive bleeding. This is an example of passing the Mayo scissors or Metzenbaum scissors rather deep to that abductor hallucis muscle as it traverses the neurovascular bundle underneath the foot. And this is where we'll interpose that uh, amniotic membrane inside there. And again, this is a 57 year old female here who had a previous unsuccessful tarsal tunnel release distally. So for more of a distal tarsal tunnel and Baxter's nerve entrapment, you can see the abductor hallucis muscle clearly here where the deep fascia covering over top of it has been sectioned. And you can see here the neurovascular bundle. And so we should be able to pull this muscle down now and release the fascia on the back side of that. And that's really a lot of times where people fall short is they don't release this fascia adequately. So tarsal coalitions, uh, I'm sure in India you see some tarsal coalitions. Uh, true incidence may be a little bit higher than, thought, than previously thought. Uh, looking at these cadaveric specimens in this study by Solomon, about 12.7% of them actually showed some form of tarsal coalition. And so <clears throat> this is a patient here. You can see left versus right. There's clear limitation in subtalar joint range of motion and mid-tarsal range of motion. These patients oftentimes will present with uh, chronic pain uh, after activity. They'll feel a sense of stiffness, but you know, there's many patients who go through their entire lives without recognizing they've had a tarsal coalition. They may present to you with a flat foot, a symptomatic flat foot when we recognize perineal spasm, uh, or they may simply go through uh, their young adult life and at some point sprain their ankle or sprain their foot or have some type of subtle injury it converts a previously asymptomatic tarsal coalition to a symptomatic tarsal coalition. Definitely different variants. This is taking a look at a middle facet coalition, that obliquity that we see here on CT. Type four, we have a complete tarsal coalition here, the middle facet. So what are operative uh, approaches to a calcaneonavicular bar? Should we do a fusion? Should we resect it? And if we resect it, do we need to do interposition? And what are the long-term outcomes? Well, in some cases, we need additional surgery in the future. So typically, people less than about 14 seem to do well with tarsal coalition resection. Uh, beyond that, if we have extensive joint involvement, if we have arthritic changes or secondary changes, in those cases, we may be better off with fusions. Well, obviously, we try not to do fusions in young people. We want to take a look at the hind foot position and determine if they're going to be correctable. And if we do a resection, can we correct them into an adequate position for normal ambulation? Or should we be moving to fusion? Again, degenerative changes secondarily. And who's the ideal candidate? Well, if less than 25% of the joints involved and there's no arthritis or no significant deformity. And if you're able to correct the deformity with periarticular osteotomies, doing things like an Evans calcaneal osteotomy is a very popular approach here in the US, uh, possibly a medial calcaneal displacement osteotomy. In the, even in the same setting, we oftentimes do both. I did two cases yesterday of a combination of both the medial calcaneal displacement and Evans lateral column lengthening. So what are the outcomes with a talocalcaneal joint if we're actually doing a posterior facet? Uh, again, 
the middle facet, posterior facet's a little harder. Middle facet seems to do much better. Uh, 50 to 94 percent of these patients do good to excellent. Uh, interestingly, beaking, which sometimes is confused with arthritis, which is not arthritis, there's no correlation with outcome. So that's an interesting finding. So what's the purpose of using an amniotic membrane in tarsal coalition? Well, again, post-operative inflammation is reduced and we reduce the scarring. We want these patients to have early range of motion. We want to maintain good range of motion, avoid any restriction. And it works very well as an interpositional material, which of course is an alternative to things like extensor to deform brevis muscle interposition or even fat grafting. Let's take a look at this. Our so coalition case here, we can see uh, this case from Bruce Cohen here, middle facet, very nice imaging. Uh, this is approach locating the middle facet. Sometimes that can be a little bit difficult, but you'll see flexor tendons immediately uh, in the region of the sustentaculum. One cheater way to do this, if you're uh, not very confident with the area, you can put a, um, a Kirshner wire through the sinus tarsi through the lateral approach and push that through the medial side and it'll come through almost directly in front of the middle facet. So you can see here pre-resection, what that looks like on the left, where we just got a solid sort of bony block and post-resection is that's taken away. You can see the articular surface available here now. So this is all kind of a bony material. So once this is all cleared away here, but at the same time trying to preserve that underlying almost articular layer for the sustentaculum that allows the flexor tendons to glide. And here's a beautiful interposition of this amniotic membrane into that resection site. So long-term follow-up, you can see this particular patient has excellent range of motion of the uh, subtalar joint. And so much so that you can see her beautiful boots there that she's now able to wear. Let's see if I can make that play a little bit better. I, I had to have a laugh that she came into to the office wearing these high-heeled boots, but she had quite good range of motion here. Calcino navicular bar resection. This is an example of somewhere where we're interposing the extensor digitorum brevis muscle. So again, a dorsolateral incision. We take this large trapezoidal portion of bone. Uh, we take that out and we want to maintain that area because it does have a tendency to try to uh, grow back together. So we want to do a very generous resection. And then again, you can see here this amniotic membrane placed into all those nooks and crannies to prevent a physical barrier. Interestingly, we do see a fairly high rate of wound issues using inter extensor digitorum brevis muscle and bo uh, bone wax, mainly because of the bleeding associated with the EDB. Um, graft can be inlaid there again, and it can also be combined with the extension digitorum brevis, but we seem to have fairly good outcomes with that. So Achilles tendon surgery, uh, tendinosis is always a big challenge. So when patients fail three to six months of non-operative therapy for chronic tendinosis with peritinonitis, we typically do excision or debridement of the diseased tendon, and we take a full thickness central core of degenerative tissue out and then we excise down to healthy uh, tendon. And this is an example here of taking out that disease central portion and then doing an inlay graft with this amniotic membrane to reduce adhesions, and it's just sewn over top. Here's an example of an onlay graft. After this has been centrally excised, the tendon's repaired, and then the graft is laid on top of that. Perineal tendon surgery fairly effective for uh, non-operative treatment of perineus brevis tears. We find these often as an incidental finding on MRI. Many times patients come to us with some other vague complaint in their ankle and we notice an incidental finding of a perineus brevis tendon. Most of these people in our hands uh, seem to have uh, non-operative treatment initially for several months, uh, but eventually many of those people fail, particularly if they have hind foot malalignment where they get continued degenerative changes. Many of those are not traumatic in nature, but just a chronic hind foot malalignment, such as hind foot varus, where they get a degenerative tendinopathy. So this Krauss classification, grade one is if it's involving less than 50%, grade two if it's involving more than 50%. Perineus longus tears tend to be a little bit less common. We see these in a different location in terms of symptoms. The perineus brevis oftentimes in the retrofibular groove or just slightly distal to the tip of the fibula, whereas the perineus longus tends to be in the area of the perineal tubercle or just slightly distal on the lateral wall of the calcaneus and also into the area under the cuboid groove where it dives into the bottom of the foot in the cuboid tunnel. 
these patients will have pain and weakness with range of motion and eversion of the hind foot or plantar flexion of the first ray. Painful os perineum syndrome, another diagnosis. This is sometimes a bit difficult uh, to treat and difficult even to diagnose in some cases. We'll see this oftentimes combined with perineus longus tendinopathy where the perineus or, or the um, os perineum becomes symptomatic and you need to decompress and debride the tendon as well as remove that pathologic os. Here's a os perineum syndrome with a perineus longus tear. And this, as you can see, is a transfer of longus to brevis. And then there's an interposition between the two tendons there. Perineal subluxation, this is a very common thing that we see uh, associated with skiers and snowboarders here in the US. And you can see a superior perineal retinaculum is a little bit root loose or torn away from uh, chronic injury. The tendon is repaired <clears throat> in a um, tubularized fashion after debriding it. The superior perineal retinaculum is uh, repaired over top of the amniotic membrane, which we can see here. So we'll repair this entire layer, oftentimes with a fiber sutured tape as well for augmentation. Uh, this is uh, the parachute type technique <clears throat> where we'll oftentimes lay this between the sheath of the tendon and the skin, where it's pulled in through with this uh, sutured material. Let's see if I can get this video to play here. You can see his little suture material here. Sorry, it's running a little bit jaggedy here. I hope you can see that. And here we'll just kind of see as that kind of slides in in that little barrier there. Neuroma, Morton's neuroma, not commonly used, but certainly an option. Particularly, as we know, we have a risk of stump neuroma in 10 patients or 10% of patients where they can be left with something worse than what they started with. Interposition, this is always a difficult problem. Freiburg's, we can do a tilt up type osteotomy, the second metatarsal for aseptic necrosis. Uh, but sometimes those joints are fairly uh, degenerative, and this makes a nice interpositional material, certainly better than an implant. Posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, you can put that between the hardware and the skin, particularly in the lateral column lengthening where we have irritation over the hardware. In some cases, if we're using a plate for Evans osteotomy. Total ankle replacement, again, this doesn't always have to be a barrier, but just the almost similar to what Infuse does where we have um, cellular signaling, this does the same thing where if it's in the area, it decreases inflammation. So it doesn't have to be a physical barrier. There's a case of a 16 year old male who chopped the top of his foot with an ax while splitting wood. Uh, he came in after being sutured up in the emergency room without re recognizing the uh, extent of his injury. And you can see here, he underwent a repair of the EHL tendon. And then postoperatively, unfortunately he developed a recurrent rupture when he tripped and fell. You can see that torn through. So a revision and then a burrito wrap with the amniotic membrane. And we can see if we can make this play here. Well, okay, we post operative, so we can see a beautiful range of motion. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, no issues with scarring or adhesions, which this you would expect okay, after a, a revision type tendon surgery there. Also some interest in treating things such as plantar fasciitis and wounds. Uh, there's quite a few of the wound care centers here that are using it. Um, this is a patient who had a, a medial wound following total ankle replacement. Of course, we know that's a high risk area for wounds. Uh, the patient was treated here for uh, looks like about 28 days and then completely healed. So again, why amniotic membrane? Uh, looking at newer technologies, reduced scarring and inflammation, regenerative properties, uh, more than 25 year history here in the US, but becoming more frequently used. Uh, over 300 publications and close to 300,000 implantations to date. And this is a very costly technology here in the US. Uh, I shudder to tell you that they can cost upwards of $2,000 for a single graft. 2000 US dollars. Um, I'd be interested to know if this is available in India at all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michael, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, it was really inspiring, but definitely the cost is a major limiting factor. And uh, we have a few questions. One question from Dr. Aditya Agrawal, and he's asking, about the allergic reactions from uh, uh, this method. Do you have any 
incidence of allergic reaction? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. I've not seen a single incidence of an allergic reaction or graft rejection, truthfully. Not a single evidence of that. Okay. And uh, yeah, have you observed any regenerative properties in humans? As you have shown that in animals, they have shown the regenerative properties in rats. And not, uh, yeah, the, the data is not, not strong at this point for regenerative properties. But of course, if you're looking at things like ophthalmic surgery, there's quite a bit of literature regarding the eye and some, some promising results in the eye. Okay, and uh, how do you compare the results with the cartiva? In helix rigidus, yeah, cartiva, cartiva the synthetic very, very uh, cartilage. That's very interesting. Is cartiva available in India now? Uh, no. No. You know, I think we were all very excited when Cartiva came to market, especially with this level one study uh, that came out with from people like Alistair Younger. Um, you know, I, I ran into Murray Penner a few years ago, I guess about a year and a half ago now, and he told me he'd stopped using it. I've done a few Cartiva cases myself. Uh, they're all still in. I have no uh, explants at this point. But with that said, I think Cartiva is completely losing favor here in the US. I think that that product is not long to be in the armamentarium of, of you know, up-to-date foot and ankle surgeons. I gave a talk at our national surgical meeting this past year looking at that and the failure rates are pretty dismal. Um, there's a good pipe paper that just came out of Los Angeles not long ago looking at the failure rate and it's high. And what we see is you get a significant inflammatory reaction or lucency around the implant uh, where you start to get loosening. I've seen cases where they've extruded and come through the top of the foot where they're almost poking through the top of the foot. And we're seeing a huge number of legal cases with this as well. I have a friend who just contacted me and told me he has six cases currently that he's defending where surgeons are being sued over the Cartiva. So, you know, the idea is, is we're leaving these implants a little bit more proud to act as a physical buffer but uh, nevertheless, they're just not doing well. And we've even experimented with putting a screw proximal to them to act as a, as a buffer so they can't subside because subsidence is an issue with them. But uh, I'm, I'm not impressed. I, I would say I've got to believe three in, they're still there and fair results at best. Yeah. Uh, a question from, uh, a question from uh, Dr. Rajiv, uh, are there any studies uh, showing favorable use of amniotic membrane over fat graft and bone wax in coalition. I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite understand that last part. Uh, studies which show favorable use of uh, amniotic membrane over fat graft and bone wax in coalition excision. Uh, versus, versus bone wax, are you asking? Yeah, fat graft and bone wax. Yeah, so that that's uh, that's what I'm saying is you know it's a good alternative. I don't know that it's better. It, you know, let's be real, it's two or three thousand dollars. It's an option here in the U.S. Uh, we have to pre-authorize all of these graphs graphs here for the insurance companies, and many of them deem it uh, experimental and they won't pay for it. So we certainly do do a lot of tarsal coalitions where we're still doing interpositional fat and bone wax and things like that or muscle belly. If we can get it covered, I certainly prefer it, but. Um, you know, we certainly do both as well. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have other questions. So Michael, thank I you. Question. I have a question for Michael. Thank you. Please. Malar, you can ask. Yeah, yeah. Michael, uh, we in the residency used to use the fresh uh, placental membrane over uh, open dressings in the uh, in surgical cases. Oh, that's do great. Think, yeah, yeah, tell me about do it. Do you think that, uh, do you think something similar? Because that was not, say, sterile. It was just from the gynec, uh, the OBS uh, patient we used to get that placental membrane. So do you think uh, that that sort of a thing could work uh, to the something amniotic uh, membrane which you are talking about? Well, this is it. It's, it's, the, it's the, the placental membrane, right? So I think it's very similar. You know, it, the question is, is disease transmission and sterilization process and things. And that's always difficult. Okay. So tell me about your success with that. I'm curious to know. That's, that's really fascinating. 
I, I don't think uh, we were the students in the surgery uh, term at, at, at that time they were using it. So I, I, I'm not the person who was directly using it, but we were, we saw them using the placental membrane for open uh, wounds of the limbs. So here comment. also, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there is a comment uh, by Dr. Asit Mehta that it is being used in corneal ulcers. So corneal ulcers, yeah. Also here um, foot in Foot and Ankle International, there was an article not long ago out of West Virginia uh, by Bob Santrock that compared uh, plantar fascial injections using the granulated placental membrane that's reconstituted in saline versus corticosteroid injections and found slightly better results with it. So it wasn't strikingly better, but it is something that we're seeing here in the US. Okay. So we move on to next talk. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Thank you. Yeah, the next talk is by Dr. Rajiv Shah, our own Dr. Rajiv, who is uh, president of uh, Asia Pacific Foot and Ankle Council and uh, is past president of Indian Foot and Ankle Society and managing director of uh, Sunshine Global Hosp Chain of Hospitals. And uh, I invite him to uh, uh, take his talk on the innovations uh, in foot and ankle in trauma. Dr. Rajiv. Yeah, if you could allow me to share my screen. Yes. Uh, I hope uh, my screen is visible to you all. Yes, very well visible. Yes, sir. And, Proceed, uh, please. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so change is the way of life. May it be iPhone, notes, car, or the advertisement. And change is also the way of orthopedics. We were going ahead with a primary kind of fusion, and now we have moved to a kind of biological fixation. We at Baroda Orthopedic Associations also had to change. We had one of our speaker who was to speak on sports injury in foot and ankle, Dr. Carlo Bourbon, president of Philippines Foot and Ankle Society, who had a medical emergency on his kit and had to really change his schedule and he was not available. And that's why I'm proceeding with this talk. So it's time to change. Let's leave the change. Change definitely is a good thing. So that's what I'm going to talk today. What are the changing newer trends in foot and ankle trauma management? And what has changed? Concepts have changed, techniques have changed, implants have changed, and technology has changed. And let's look forward to all this one after another. So what are the change concepts in foot and ankle trauma management? Now, is this a stable one or is this a unstable one? Uh, isolateral lateral malleolus fracture. And we were taught that the medial examination is the key. A swelling on the medial side, echi muscles on the medial side means unstable lateral malleolar fracture and it requires fixes. But today it is believed that medial examination is unreliable you need to do a gravity stress testing or other stress views to make sure whether this fracture, which looks innocuous on gravity stress testing, opens up, displaces, and there is a medial open clear space. So a stress testing is a must to decide about stability of every isolated lateral malleolar fracture. We had a concept about posterior malleolus fixation that if it is more than 25% of the tibial articular surface, or if the fracture has depression or the step into the articular surface of more than 3 mm, this requires fixation, may it be from anterior to posterior or posterior to anterior, or maybe it with a screw. But this has changed. And now it is believed that it is not the size of the posterior malleolus. It is the stability of the ankle matters. It is the attachment of strong posterior inferior tibiofibular ligaments, syndesmotic ligament, which requires fixation of posterior malleolus from posterior to anterior and preferably with a buttress plate. 
syndesmosis we have had lot of controversies in syndesmosis but now it is believed that either for a syndesmotic reduction either you use arthroscopy but better would be a open reduction where you see it under vision with a 2 to 4 cm incision at and near the syndesmosis so this kind of fracture would definitely require a syndesmotic fixation in an open way so for syndesmosis the concept is go ahead with open reduction as far as possible avoid clamp use finger for your reduction and soft fixation with a screw fixation is more preferred and the reduction is to be assessed not at the incisura but at the joint line where you want to see mercedes benz sign so these are change concept for syndesmotic fixation deltoid injuries we were taught that deltoid injuries are to be treated conservatively we always learned from the literature that the acute repair of deltoid ligament is not indicated but if we see the present concepts it is said that it is better to address deltoid injuries surgically so that you can mobilize the patient fast and the later death complications are avoided so today the tune is to do the deltoid repair or reconstruction every ankle fracture should be stressed to rule out deltoid injury once you do complete fixation and it is advisable to repair deltoid ligament in an active individual less frank injury we know that it can it should not be fixed with the ky wire but we do fix we do use to fix it with the screws today it is understood that the bridging plates are better than the screws because these bridge plates do not violate articular cartilage of the small tarsal bones and thereby they really prevent occurrence of later date arthritis so bridge plates are preferred over the screws that's a change concept for less frank fixation zones fracture we used to treat it conservatively with plaster immobilization but it is now believed that intramedullary screw to be used for young active and sports population for zones fracture because it heals with a delay and so if it is fixed in a sportsman or in a young and active individual with this screw it gives a better result certain fractures we used to do primary fusion because they were non reconstructable looking at such kind of pilon fractures it was advised that they are non reconstructable and you can go ahead and do primary fusion but like elsewhere in the body primary fusion is not preferred it is a fixation which is preferred over the primary fusion in non reconstructable pilon fractures or considering a case of sender four fracture i used to believe that sender four requires primary fusion but the literature has come up and changed the concept saying that try to fix sender four calcaneus to the best of your ability so that later dead fusion over that reconstructed surface is easier the another concept change is into the midfoot fractures which were non reconstructable should not be primarily fused but you try to reconstruct them with a fixation and that is how in this case we did so like elsewhere in the body later dead fusion is easier if primary reconstruction is carried out for non reconstructable pilon calcaneus and midfoot fractures mal united ankle fractures we should we were treating it with ankle fusion but it is said that ankle is a very very important joint and as far as possible try to follow reconstruction then fusion like we did in this case this lady presented to us at the end of 6 months with this kind of mal united fracture which was reconstructed so reconstruction in ankle fracture and this are these are the kind of movements she got after reconstruction of the ankle fracture so reconstruction of ankle people have tried up to 3 4 5 years if there is a flocal arthritis and there is no global arthritis which has set in so that was with respect to change concepts in foot and ankle trauma management now i'm going to talk about some newer techniques which have come for foot and ankle trauma management so the most in technique is arthroscopy assisted fixation for all intra articular fractures to delineate cartilage injury to do accurate reduction to delineate injury to the uh, bone 
osteochondral lesions, ligaments, you need to do an arthroscopy assisted fixation. This female 34 had a road traffic accident. She's a motorcyclist holding Limca book record. And this is how she had her ankle fracture with uh, impacted articular uh, depression. This was the CT scan like intraarticular fracture, a high demand athlete, what next? So for her, we went in for AAORIF, that is arthroscopy assisted open reduction internal fixation. So two, uh, the, the first stage external fixator was put in. We waited for the wrinkles. In the second stage, we went in for uh, an arthroscopy assisted open reduction internal fixation. Two portals were created. This is how the uh, fragment which was lying in the ankle was pushed up and fixed temporarily with the K-wire. This is how osteochondral lesion of the tibia was treated. And then joystick reduction of the fracture followed by definitive fixation with the look into the joint, whether we have reduced it nicely, whether we have reconstructed the articular surface nicely or not. And then final fixation went on. She won the championship of 2018, drove 4,500 kilometers from Assam and came to meet me. This was in 2016. This was in 2018 that she has started driving her car and a full range of movement. Another case of pylon fracture, again, intraarticular C2, C3 type fractures, arthroscopy assisted, open reduction, internal fixation. And there were this kind of depressions which are lifted up and articular reduction was reconstructed. Calcaneus fracture, minimally invasive calcaneus surgery is now practiced with dry or wet subtalar arthroscopy. Even open reduction internal fixation of calcaneus is also practiced added with a dry subtalar arthroscopy where 2.7 mm 30 degree scope is being used. And a fracture line which is reduced well or not can be identified with the use of anterior and posterior dry subtalar arthroscopy whenever you are doing a calcaneus fracture fixation. Now, this is the case of my friend, Finit Fit School. Uh, when you have really very poor soft tissues, arthroscopy assisted fixation helps you. This was the case of compound fracture dislocation talus. Talus was extruded out and the skin condition, which was good, was on a posterior aspect. So posterior ankle arthroscopy was done and talus was reduced back. These are some intra-articular, intraoperative pictures. Two posterior anterior screws were passed after doing the reduction. And this is how a bad talus fracture was fixed with the arthroscopic assistance. So arthroscopic assistance helps in precise reconstruction of intra-articular fractures, where you want to delineate ligament injuries, cartilage injuries, and detect and treat osteochondral lesions of the bone. There is another emerging technique that is when you have a poor soft tissues for a calcaneus fracture, you could do minimally invasive fixation and you can augment the size of the bone with a balloon kyphoplasty. And this is how you can push in a balloon. You can expand the depressed bone. You can lift up the depressed articular surface and fill it with the cement. And this is really used in the articular depressions in calcaneus as well as midfoot fractures. Uh, this is a uh, 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 technique developed by Professor Nunley. So wherever he feels that the blood supply is at risk, he uses uh, uh, bone uh, vascularized bone pedicle grafts from the uh, cuneiform into talus, into cuboid, into navicular, wherever he wants to put it. The vessel is dissected and the pedicle is turned like this and then pedicle is attached into the fractured area. And this is how it helps into the healing of the fracture, more so into stress fractures whenever it is being operated into the athletes. So vascularized pedicle bone grafts, they help in the reconstruction of talus and navicular fractures, which has very high chance of avascular necrosis. Now coming to some newer implant, which has come in foot and ankle trauma management. These are Memory staples, these are Nichilon memory staples, which has that memory. And once you put it into the fracture, they give compression of that particular fracture. 
people have started using internal brace that is a mini tight rope for lisfranc fracture where lisfranc fracture compression is done and the problem of the breakage of the screw or the extraction of the screw is avoided by using this internal brace there are metal cages which are being used for the bone loss the cages are the one which we use in the spine fracture and that has been used into the midfoot and forefoot bone losses filled up with the bone grafts now fibular nails are used into the conditions where you have really poor conditions skin condition old aged patient osteoporotic diabetic patient where you want to do fibular fixes and you want to do syndesmotic fixes and you can use fibular nails and you can do this kind of fixes and it's a locking nail with the mechanism where you can do syndesmotic fixes and through the fibular nail intramedullary nail for calcaneus fracture is in war since long and it is the one which really prevents the later date collapse of the calcaneus fracture that is what is said antibiotic implanted nails are available for tibio talo calcaneal fusion for defect for infection so these are some newer implants which are available in for foot and ankle trauma management and lastly i'm going to talk about some newer technologies which has come into foot and ankle trauma management very very important for ankle fractures is intraoperative ct scan when we think that this fracture is a simple fracture but it has got a uh, injury of syndesmosis this is how the modified cotton test looks like with a simple innocuous looking ankle fracture and this is how the entero posterior balotment test looks in and even if you reduce the syndesmosis well you are really afraid whether this syndesmosis is well fixed or not and mal reduction chances are quite high and so a uh, ideal tool to help surgeon intraoperatively is intraoperative 3d imaging where you can image intraoperatively to detect mal reductions which may go unnoticed under on radiographs or cm especially rotatory mal alignment some intraarticular implant are there or not whether implant is pierced intraarticularly or not you can detect you can detect loose bodies and you can detect marginal joint defects and by intraoperative 3d imaging intraoperative ct scan is available for fixation of the ankle fractures at many uh, renowned centers in the world where they do verify syndesmotic reduction before and after syndesmotic fixation through a intraoperative ct scan weight bearing ct scan is another breakthrough technology in foot and ankle uh, orthopedics and trauma because you want to have a visualization in three dimensional uh, architecture of 28 bones which are there in foot and ankle you want to really know the angles between this bone the line slopes everything and you really want to understand that how trauma has impacted this uh, fractures and so it has become very very essential in understanding of less frank injury more so subtle less frank injury syndesmotic injury again syndesmotic sprains very very important and some subtle fractures and some stress fractures in foot and ankle weight bearing ct scan is being used unfortunately it is yet not available in india in weight bearing ct scan you could see such kind of subtle less frank subluxation and dislocations and there is now a international weight bearing ct society who studies extensively utilization of weight bearing ct in foot and ankle orthopedics allograft replacement for fractures where you have bony defect is being used extensively in foot and ankle look at this case case of a road traffic accident in a young adult who had a crush injury of the foot with compound crush fracture of the talus that of the medial dome had a compound comminuted fracture fibula on day 1 debridement was done and this was the kind of picture after debridement on the lateral side and this were the x rays when he was referred to us at the end of two weeks so this were the x rays two k wires were pushed in and this was the clinical picture so that was the foot x ray ct scan again showed lot of comminution into the medial aspect of the talus which almost looked like crushed medial side of talus this were the ct images again 
coronary leakaging. So he went in for the surgery number two, where a debridement was done. Axial fixator was put in. An antibiotic impregnated cement spacer was put in for excised dead pieces of medial talus. Antibiotics were also placed in, and vacuum assisted dressing was done. So that was a lateral clinical image after the second surgery, which we did. And then this was a closer view. We put in a vac application, and this were the X-rays where fibula was fixed with the two K wires, and the medial lost part of the talus talus was replaced with a uh, antibiotic impregnated cement spacer. This was the lateral view, and then it went on to heel skin grafting was done over the vac area, and this was. At the end of six weeks, that fixator was removed, everything looked healed, and then patient was taken for a definitive fixation. So what next? There were problems like precarious soft tissue envelope, segmentally short fibula with combination and bone loss, and 55% of the talar body was lost. How to replace? And then there was a shell of the neck with a fracture of the neck of talus, how to fix? And these all problems were solved with where precarious soft tissue envelope, we went in for a medial approach and lateral approach was at the anterior border of the fibula. And segmental short fibula plus combination was treated with the restoration of the fibular length and a syndesmotic fixation and bone grafting. 55% of the talar body which was lost was replaced with allograft talus of almost matching size. This was the allograft talus received. And then this was the spacer, which was removed. And that into which uh, allograft talus, which was shaped like a lost medial part of the talar body was kept in and fixed with the two screws. And we did match the ankle surface to of the graft with the ankle surface of original bone. Posterior shell of the neck of talus was treated with cancellous bone grafting and fixation of the screws. And ultimately, this was the final result. So allograft replacement is a viable option in foot and ankle trauma with defects. The last part of my discussion on to technology would be 3D printing, which would be to our rescue for trauma and bone loss. And we have 3D printed cages available, which can fill up any bone defect. This is the case of uh, one of my friends who treated this case with a 3D printed cage. Loss of the bone was treated with a 3D printed cage. Or a defect or the talar AVN was treated with a cage through which bone grafts and TTC nailing was done. So this was the final result. So this is available for a uh, surgeon to really use for a fusion. But look at this case. I have presented this case before also in BOA, so I'll just rush through. This was a case where there was lost talus due to a compound injury. Patients relative, they brought talus in this kind of a shape after three days, and they wanted me to put it back. I got CT scan of this talus, which was brought from the... Uh, injury site and got a titanium 3D printed total talus prosthesis. This was then implanted into the uh, ankle and this is how the implantation went in and these were the post-operative images of this patient. And thereafter we must have done now seven or eight total talus replacements, some with the modification where we have restored, reconstructed the ligaments also. And all of them, now this is the case where we had a medial as well as lateral ligament uh, innovated into a total talar prosthesis. And look at this kind of movements these patients get at the end of three months after total talus replacement. And look at the way this patient uh, after a bad talar injury was treated with total talus replacement was walking at the end of three months. So 3D printed total talus replacement is probably the most accepted technology. You, we do not really know how long would it last, but presently it's a technology which is involved. So to end, he said this before many years. 
not the strongest not the fittest not the intelligent who would survive but it is the one who is most adaptable to change would survive and that's how the choma management has also changed over a period of years thank you very much and thank you boa for giving me this opportunity thank you dr rajiv for a wonderful presentation uh, we have few questions there is a question from dr asit mehta and uh, he is asking is titrop well established for syndesmotic fixation because in one of the conference he has found that some surgeons are giving up because they were not happy with that any comments from your side please yeah titrop is getting more and more accepted into fixation of syndesmosis because it's a biological fixation but yes people have been have started using two titropes in a different direction so far as i am concerned given a choice if my patient is affording i am going to use titro the only place where titro is not superior to the screws is a late presenting case or case where you are trying to reconstruct the mal united ankle fracture where you need a stronger fixation where you use screws but again this is a big controversy uh, this is just my personal opinion malar uh make a comment a question from uh, dr sejal uh, any grade of acute deltoid injury uh, which has to be surgically repaired so are there any guidelines regarding which grade should be surgically repaired it's a great question so any ankle fracture you do the fixation you need to stress that fracture for looking for the deltoid instability so that should be the dictum and if you find that it will i mean there are no grades given there are no uh, pro, uh, kind of an algorithm given but if you find that compared to the opposite side the side on to which you have an injury is little more lax you decide that are you going to really go in and explore this or not if it's an if the patient is an active individual is a sports person it would always be advisable to go in explore the deltoid ligament and reconstruct the deltoid ligament repair uh, it with the tight uh, paint over uh, vest techniques or whatever techniques you are comfortable with especially old age patients or the patients who uh, do not have such a great kind of activity level you may treat such patients conservatively where the old advice was to put this patient into mild inversion and give a splintage for two weeks more suppose we were to give splintage for four weeks it was advised to give for six weeks but the bottom line is the whole world has now realized that it is the deltoid ligament which is very very crucial and we should try to give perfect anatomy to a active young individual Dr. Sejal Shah wants to know the long-term results of balloon kyphoplasty uh, of calcaneum. Yeah, long-term results of balloon kyphoplasty are not yet published in the literature, but many of the people who started doing it, they have stopped it because you really cannot reconstruct calcaneus into a complete three-dimensional. Uh, Three-dimensional kind of uh, uh, shape and size. You would be able to lift up or jack up the articular surface, but you may in turn blast the lateral wall more because of the volume of your cement or volume of your balloon than what you really wanted. Uh, so uh, results are available. Many of the workers who started it have left it. Like I know, my friend Dr. Selin Parekh started it with great enthusiasm, and he has now stopped it. another question uh, is from dr alpesh what are the long term results and complications of post uh, uh, total talus replacement uh the talus replacement which i have done they are all 3d printed total talus replacement there is only one study which has been published by selin parekh that two of 14 cases and that has got two years survival see before hand there are multiple reports from the eastern literature from the japan where they showed that survivorship of total talus replacement was 
अप टू थर्टी फाइव टू फिफ्टी ईयर्स माइंड यू दे हैड टोटल टैलस रिप्लेसमेंट वेर टैलस वॉज रिकन्स्ट्रक्टेड बाय देयर इंजीनियर्स थ्री डी प्रिंटिंग टेक्नोलॉजी वॉज नॉट यूज सो फार एज माई केसेज आर कंसर्न I have used it in trauma more than in avascular necrosis of talus. So avian talus tra a trauma again 3D printed total talus replacement for trauma is not yet been done extensively in Western world. So results you do not know. So I tell my patient that we are going to give you moments. We do not know how many months, how many years this would last. This is an experimental surgery. If you want to undergo this surgery with that will, that consent, I can go in and do this surgery. So sorry, no long-term results of 3D printed total talus replacement, particularly for trauma, are available. There is a question from Dr. Asit Mehta. Do we need to open up syndesmotic syndesmosis if using tight rope, as it's a soft fixation and fibula will be automatically reduced? So I think we are confusing here. Use of an implant is one, one situation. But the reduction of the syndesmosis is second. Like elsewhere in the body, we reduce the fracture and then we put in the implant. No implant gives us that reduction. Tight rope is to be put in as a positional device. So reduction is primarily to be done, and then you are fixing tight rope or screw. So you do need to reduce, and that reduction you should be doing under vision or under arthroscopy. another question uh, another question is do you recommend mri in ankle injuries in addition to ct scan to know the ligament status not really the only case where or only type of cases where i advise mri in ankle fractures is one when i see flack of the bone on the lateral side these are the cases which could have injury to the peroneal tendon which could have injury to the superficial peroneal retinaculum superior peroneal retinaculum and these are the cases where you do need mri very very rarely if you have a subtle kind of syndesmotic injury in a high ankle sprain you might require your patient to undergo mri examination sometimes in ankle fracture <laughs> you also have a fragment at the tip of the lateral balance where you want to see whether this fragment has injured your atfl or cfl or not that time also you can think of mri yeah, in your present yeah please molar uh, rajiv bhai uh, regarding total talus replacement is there a difference between the ceramic which the japanese uh, uh, literature mentions and the titanium ones yeah so japanese initial all cases they did were with the titanium and so their first study was with by and large titanium implant thereafter they started using ceramic since the ceramic uh, came as a, a, a very good uh, implant uh, uh, kind of a metal so there are no comparative studies by them between a ceramic and titanium so far as world is concerned world over in the eastern world as well as western world whatever total talus are being uh, uh, produced they are titanium metal not ceramic regarding the use of allografts what precautions we need to uh, observe while using the allograft and uh, uh, what type of special consent we have to take from the patients and are there any medical legal issues while using the allograft so i will answer the last question first there are no medical legal issues so that you can use allograft uh, 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 in every patient whomsoever patient gives contact cons consent there is a special consent which is being taken by the authorities who give this allograft so uh, i typically get this allograft from ramaya medical college bangalore so they have a fixed format of consent given to them by dgci and this consent they are taking from every patient whenever allograft is being used allograft transportation is a very very important thing and once they supply us the allograft you have to use it within 24 hours so the problem is like you getting it from bangalore and with the lockdown you don't have so number of good number of flights you have to send a person who will go personally take i mean take the delivery of allograft 
would come down to Bangalore, to Ahmedabad, and from Ahmedabad to Baroda by car. And then once you receive it, once that is delivered, you have to operate and use that allograph within 24 hours. So you might have to start your surgery early in the morning. And before you start using it, you need to wash it thoroughly with the saline and then dip it into a saline plus gentamicin solution. So that's what precaution, as a precaution, you do need to take. Okay. Like while showing the syndesmotic fixation, you specifically told that clamp should not be used. How can you explain the logic behind not using the clamp and what if we use it, what can happen? Yeah. So what is most important when we are using the clamp is clamp has to be on the surface of the bone. And if you see the image into the Siam clamp, the tip of the clamp should be facing flush to the bone. It should not be anterior or posterior. So that's one important thing. Second thing, clamp has to be put in in the direction of syndesmotic screw or tight rope. So that is posterolateral to anteromedial. So if you misfire into putting such a kind of clamp and then you compress, the clamp would uh, push fibula anteriorly or posteriorly. So there are studies which have come up and shown that the <laughs> clamp could be the reason for malreduction. And so majority of the people have stopped using clamp. Uh, if you want to use a clamp, make sure that your clamp is properly positioned and your fibula do not slide anteriorly or posteriorly by use of clamp. Typically, I use clamp for my cases which are late presenting cases or suppose I am reconstructing the ankle fracture, I am going to use a clamp. But whenever I'm using a clamp, I do take some precaution. I put, I reduce the syndesmosis, put a syndesmotic reduction holding wire, and then I put an anterior blocking wire, which is flush to the anterior cortex of the fibula, which will not allow fibula to slide up whenever I'm pushing my, whenever I'm, I'm, I'm tightening my clamp, it is keeping that fibula flush and is not sliding anteriorly. So whenever, if you're using a clamp, make sure that your fibula do not slide upwards or downwards, because the ballotment of the fibula is more or the uh, anteroposterior ballotment of the fibula is more than the mediolateral ballotment. That is what we all know about syndesmotic injuries. Okay. I, uh, I think uh, any more questions from the attendees? Okay. Uh, I, uh, Sejal, can you uh, please uh, yeah. round off the meeting? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, I would like to end the meeting with uh, one of the few very good quote. Live as if, live as if you were not to die tomorrow and learn, learn as if you were to live forever. This is by the famous quote by the Gandhiji. And I would like to thank uh, international faculty, particularly Dr. Salin Parekh from the USA and Dr. Michael for giving a wonderful session on the foot and angle, ankle. And I'm also thankful to the moderator, uh, Nikesh and Malhar, and uh, very much thankful to Dr. Raju Bhai for sharing the excellent knowledge and motivate us to walk on the path on our own feet to the success. Thank you, thank you everybody. And thank you, Farmed. And thank you particularly to the Mahesh Bhai, uh, Dr. Panchal sir, Dr. Vakshi, Rajesh Bhakshi, Dr. Anil Bhai, also to participate in the pre-session. Uh, and thanks team BOA and thanks to all. Thank you very much. You need just one minute. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, on behalf of Farmed, I would like to thanks to uh, Baroda Orthopedic Association and all the dignitaries of the association and also the guest speaker. So on behalf of Farbed, I just uh, conveying my sincere thanks for giving us a platform. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just closing the session. Yeah. Yes.